I want to know when Dippin' Dots is going to condemn child sex. <sighs> this is going to be a long one, pals. I think it really says something about Bo Burnham's inside that we're still discussing it to such an extensive degree well over a year after its initial release. That's in no small part due to the fact that it's undoubtedly arisen to the level of full-on pop culture phenomenon, but I really think this ever-continuing discussion on the special is largely due to simply how much material is densely packed into the thing that can be critically analyzed and deconstructed and dissected. However, now, with the release of the Inside Outtakes, I feel we've almost unlocked a cipher that'll allow us entry further into the vast array of themes explored and touched on during Inside. However, there's not just a heaping load of thematic meaning to discuss, but parasociality and the irony of the special's explosion in public discourse, and, well, I'd tell you where I'm going with this, but... You don't wanna know. Is there anyone out there? Social media, it's just the market's answer to a generation that demanded to perform. This sense that all of this is going to burst at any moment, it just has to, it can't sustain like this. If you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. told me over a year ago when I first watched the special or even when I made that short shitty five minute video a day after watching the special that it would reach the popularity it has now I mean I I'd be flabbergasted in all honesty I do feel as though there's validity to the take that the initial special really has been dissected to death in pretty much every conceivable way Completely varying opinions and interpretations have over time colored in every untouched corner of the work, leaving no stone unturned as one may say. That is, until the outtakes special dropped, giving us much more to think on, work with, reflect on. Fleeting thoughts prompted by the original are now notably fleshed out details highlighted in the new special, and material included within the new special also allows us an opportunity to further analyze the themes of Inside through what footage was left in versus what was scrapped. This is one of the prime factors and why I like to call the Inside Outtakes a cipher of sorts to the original Inside special, as it perfectly fits together with that first special as an additional piece to the puzzle, answering more and giving us a bigger picture of what Mr. Burnham himself was trying to convey. Jesus Christ, it's been like half a year since I've made a fucking video. <sighs> maybe I should... Hmm. Yeah, maybe I could, if I dissected it into parts... Oh, maybe that'd make it easier for myself. I mentioned before that the inside outtakes have the potential to work as a cipher for the original special due to the way in which it shows us songs and bits that didn't fit with Bo Burnham's general artistic vision for Inside. I think the immediately obvious difference between the two specials is that the Inside outtakes lack the same level of isolation as the original Inside special. Bits like the Inside podcast or The Dump may just feature Bo riffing off of himself, but they're also written in such a way as to mimic legitimate communication between multiple human beings. Two testosterone-fueled dude bros running a podcast an interview with a film's creative team. Even though the dump is still isolated in that it's styled like a sort of Zoom call, its point isn't to directly critique that level of isolation like he does in songs like FaceTime with my mom tonight in the original special. The isolation inherent in these types of video calls is not remotely the intended thesis to take away from this little bit. Five years can be seen in the same way, as even though Bo is performing both parts in the song, he's joking about simple relationship conflicts and arguments, once again bringing focus to this idea of traditional human connection that he intentionally left out from the original special. It also probably doesn't help that the song was written and performed pre-COVID and as such doesn't really have much relevance to the actual setting of the special. Five years, five years. 
finest, finest. We order Chinese, I'm eating my dumplings. You reach over and you take my dumplings. But to continue further, even the focus on spiders in the outtake special does bring focus to other creatures outside of just Bo. Inside is a one-man show to the fucking extreme. Really, the only sequence in which Bo isn't isolated or stuck reflecting on himself is just the certifiably based sequence with Sako, which is just him with a fucking hand puppet. Like, this is the most human interaction we actually really see Bo engage in within Inside, and it's just a scripted conversation and sing-along with a politically charged sock puppet. It's pretty clear that a large goal with Inside's general structure was to portray the infinite echo chamber of madness that this level of isolation ends up producing. A reverberating depiction of being trapped within your own mind creatively. One of the interesting constants in Inside is the repetition of Bo watching himself. watching his art, watching this process as part of the process, thus trapping himself in this, once again, echo chamber of introspective hell. There's the unpaid intern reaction bit, which particularly plays this up, but even in sequences like the Twitch stream, Bo is specifically watching his average day of tears, boredom, and music writing. There's that half second shot early in the special of him as a Twitch streamer that's often acknowledged as a reference to Fight Club, and while I do think it of course is a reference to that film on some level, I also feel it further perpetuates the notion of constantly watching yourself and nothing but yourself for a long period of time. There are so many goddamn shots from inside of him watching previous songs or bits he's just finished editing, and I feel like as a whole, this is a major through line of the special. I also feel as though that infinite self-regurgitation gets a very fitting visual representation at the end of This Isn't a Joke from the Outtake special. Then again, the camera filming him with a camera filming him with a camera filming him with a etc. isn't even limited to just this moment from the Outtake special. I'm in a meta prison of my own mirrored image all the time. Okay, before moving on to some larger concepts we can dig into and really analyze, I'd like to go through some rapid fire observations and notes about certain songs and segments of the outtake special, since this will probably be my only opportunity maybe ever to do so? The song Biden is hilariously and depressingly relatable, but was probably cut both due to being sort of irrelevant by the time of the May 2021 release date, and due to Bo seemingly not wanting to date the special itself. You'll notice in the special that he doesn't even really ever explicitly speak about COVID at all, or go into any real specifics about the world situation. He does speak about the year 2020 in relation to his age and how he's getting older, but not in any way that really really causes the special to get too much less relevant with time, particularly since, while it can be seen through the lens of being a depiction of social quarantining and isolation in 2020, it also works just as well, if not even better, as a depiction of being trapped in your mind creatively, like I mentioned before. The Inside Deluxe album release also included a couple new tracks that didn't really appear in either special, though they did at least both have very brief mentions in the outtake special. Some people really got to survive. Some people are white, kind of 
1985 very much feels like Make Happy Era Bo, which does make sense given that it was one of the songs, along with Five Years and The Chicken, that he was performing at the Largo while workshopping material for that potential new comedy special and tour that he mentions in All Eyes on Me. You know what? I should start performing again. Microwave Popcorn is just funny. Uh, that's mostly it. Okay, pulling back to the outtake special as a whole, I find it interesting how much bolder the special is with tone when compared to inside, which is obviously much more carefully and intricately crafted from a tonal standpoint. Of course, the more experimental style of tone in the outtake special is just because it's put together from inside's leftover footage, but I do feel like it's, it's fascinating just because it gives us glimpses of alternate ways that inside could have been presented. For example, there are a surprising amount of pretty creepy or horrifying moments in the outtake special, which if made a primary focus could have completely changed the vibe of inside to adhere to a scarier direction. The special seemed to very much find itself in the editing stage, which also seemed to be a big reason why the special ended up taking so long to produce in the back half of its production cycle. And then I'll edit it and I'll watch it and then I'll feel like I'm not done, I have to do something else. Most interestingly though, the outtake special specifically includes shots that either expound upon or downright contradict points or themes from the original special. My favorite shot of this nature from the outtake special would most definitely be this one. conversation with a friend a while back in which they argued against Welcome to the Internet's thesis, as it came off to them as just old man yells at cloud, or these darn kids and their technology, or oh god, please no, god no, change no, god no, please not change, no not change, please god no, please no, which, I mean, isn't wrong? But I also think that the point being made by the song has a heaping load of validity and, you know, shouldn't be tossed aside quite so easily. Like, sure, one could argue that the fact that phones are now essentially an extension of the human body is just another step of human evolution, catapulting us through eras of progress, but also, I think one of the biggest takeaways of the song is really from the line, and it did all the things we as it brings emphasis upon the fact that these corporations and billionaires and algorithms are basically just taking advantage of our chemical processes, not to really benefit our lives in the way that human evolution ideally should do, but really to benefit the companies who unsurprisingly actually gain a lot from having 1.1 billion users on their app that feeds everyone an infinite stream of content to keep them present and addicted for as long as possible by bringing about a dysfunctional dopamine system. They are now trying to colonize every minute of your life. That is what these people are trying to do. Every single free moment you have is a moment you could be looking at your phone and they could be gathering information to target ads at you. That that's what's happening. So like as much as we can, you know, as have really good conversations and try to humanize uh, the conversations, the like mechanism of the business is is rolling towards that just because of the market. So like it's coming. It's coming for every free second you have. Yes, to quantify how likable you are, how attractive you are, how accepted you are, how watchable you are. And kids used to be able to escape this. You can't escape your social life. It's following you everywhere all of the time. I'm good. I interest you in everything. So when you develop a disassociative mental disorder in your late 20s, don't come crawling back. To I'm speaking about this because I believe it's important to emphasize the nuance in this general discussion, a point I believe Bo similarly was made making, at least to some degree, with the inclusion of this shot in the Inside Outtakes. As he's filming this song, shitting on the exploitative and radicalizing nature of the internet, he gets distracted and forgets to stop filming as he grows consumed with his own rectangular internet connected device for a good chunk of time. Now this very well may have still been staged. Art is a lie. Nothing is real. 
or it could have genuinely been a behind the scenes moment, but the artistic intent of its inclusion doesn't really change one way or another, as this is directly calling out a bit of his own hypocrisy here when he's writing this song. Things aren't black and white, and especially given that Bo himself is entirely successful specifically because of the internet, he of course isn't saying something as bold as, nah, just like, remove the internet and all technology, for real, for real, because that's ridiculous and impossible. But if it, it's not like it's just shitty, it's not like it's like we should just, uh, if we yeah, threw sure, our phones sure. in the ocean and we'd be happy, it's like, yeah. it's both. We're super connected, we're super lonely, we're mm -hmm. just, super stimulated, we're super numb, we're self-expressing and objectifying. It's like, yeah. I wouldn't be here without the internet, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, obviously, I'm so, so grateful for it. Calling attention to some of the weird and disturbing ways our culture is covered up for these capitalistic minings of our neurochemistry is just that, calling attention. Now, with that said, I do find a hefty load of irony in the fact that the special ended up fucking dominating the internet for months after its release, still holding insane weight even now. It's just absurdly hilarious that his special featuring the most criticism about the internet and algorithmic exploitation is the special that found the most success and virality on the internet, and particularly on the platform TikTok, which is literally just all of these problems maxed out to 1,000. It's quite literally a singular algorithm. It's the height of everything leading up to now. It's inescapable. And of all the platforms to really blow up inside to the moon, it's of course had to be the one. Uh, once again, fucking ironic. There was originally going to be a filmed bit here where I pretended to hop onto TikTok and look at the Bo Burnham tag and, and explore and research this for the very first time for, for this video, um, but, but I'm, I'm not doing that because I actually did all that research about five or six months ago because this video's production has, has taken a, a long time long time. But yeah, I just decided, uh, why lie to you? Why pretend like I'm looking at this for the first time when when I, I really have? Yeah, I've seen it so long ago at this point. I feel like like pretending to, to look at it for the first time now and doing a whole bit about it would be redundant. So I'm sparing you. You're welcome. Anyway, that's the end of, of this bit. So... I want to once again place emphasis on TikTok's status as the next evolution of internet technology or video browsing apps. Half of these videos, if not more, are just clips from Bo Burnham's specials and live shows, almost all of which have circulated on YouTube as well for a long time, with most of them probably actually originating there in the first place. Wouldn't it be great to be able to scratch a certain itch in your brain at every possible moment? You really like seeing versions of this song or bit, so how about we show you every single repost of the song to ever be released? YouTube originated this issue with creating clip culture. Vine amplified it, and TikTok perfected it. This isn't to say that wanting to see lots of your favorite clips is an issue or anything either, however, there definitely does come a point when these clips are practically being weaponized as a means to literally extract the maximum amount of happy chemicals from us with their incessant usage. Even though I think YouTube has a huge problem with it as well, at least YouTube gives you a choice most of the time. You can choose to click a clip that may or may not tickle your fancy. TikTok just thrusts you into it and we begin judging content solely by its first second or two. Perhaps that's a reason Bill Burnham has suddenly soared in popularity on the app. A large amount of his clips are of him performing songs, either studio recorded or live, and well, music hooks you in. Now let's try to hone this discussion back in on Bill Burnham's presence on the app specifically, rather than talking further about the app as a whole. Bo Burnham, at least to my knowledge, uh, isn't actually on TikTok, but I honestly feel that at the current moment in time, he's got more presence there than anywhere else, YouTube included. That funny feeling. Is made even curiouser when you start seeing Netflix posting their own clips of Bo Burnham, edited to make it seem like it fits with this platform and its general visual aesthetics. But the number one thing I noticed upon spending an hour or so on Bo Burnham TikTok was that so much of this content is just a translation of content 
from other mediums. Also, really quickly before expanding on this thought, I'd like to add a little disclaimer to say that I hold no ill will towards any of the TikTokers shown or referenced in this video, even if I am criticizing a specific 15 second clip or so of their content. This is more so regarding the overall culture of the app and not the individual creators. I'm on Twitter the other day and I see Bo Burnham tweet this. New merch for Inside available now on his store. Ooh, I think to myself, Inside merch, that's exciting. I go check out the website and there's some decent stuff on there. Couple shirts, couple hoodies, solid fits, cool pattern. If you couldn't just look through a merch store on your own, here you go. The experience of looking at a merch store in uh, video format. Check this out. Thank you. Thank you for your support. You are why we do it. Not even an actual clip, just someone filming their screen as they react to seeing this bit from the outtakes special. Uh, this actually makes up a, a, a weird amount of the platform. Some people are white guys in 1985. Now I actually find this one funny, but I wonder why it did such numbers. Is it because the algorithm naturally pushed two coinciding pop culture phenomenons at once and that half the creations on TikTok are purely decided by market trends and not artistic intent? <laughs> yes. I'll reiterate once more that I probably normally wouldn't care enough to be like, hmm, not a huge TikTok guy, not gonna lie. But in this particular instance, I just can't help but find it absolutely fascinating that this special is the one that did so well on this platform. I guess it just goes to show how clippable Bo's work is. As long as it can fit in bite-sized content, it can be added to the ever-expanding mass of audio-visual content here. It's Wait for it. Anything and everything, all of the time. Even this song itself has been covered and parodied and repeated so, 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 so many times. It's actually insane. This song is so much larger now. It encompasses so much more now. It's not even a song. It's been upgraded to a goddamn market trend. A culture wave? A statistic? Was it inevitable? It's a calculus. Have a look around for almost every function. Can be found. We've got mountains of rules, some easy, some cursed. If derivatives are hard for you, well, you aren't the first. Welcome to the patriarchy, there's too much to say. Medicine was all designed for men, but women aren't the same. Be youthful, be pretty, and don't show your skin. But they'll blame your looks if you're successful in anything. Welcome to the rabbit hole, this is now your life. Say goodbye to your girlfriend or boyfriend, husband or your wife. There's no need to panic, you're in for a ride. <laughs> Before you know you'll have the time of your life. Welcome to Smash Brothers, you wouldn't believe how many people want Mario to beat up Minecraft Steve. Men can't even cry without perception, they're weak and nothing's gonna change unless we get up and speak. Welcome to the hospital. Keep this man alive. He is on a ventilator, every presser to survive. Look at timelines and layers and UV test grids, and none of all the features that you've all requested. Welcome to anime. Put your cares aside. Here's a character you'd love, and here's one you just wish would die. Phantom sense is strong there, he's touching you more. Don't act surprised, you know you like it, you whore. The meditation lecture, mandatory course. Get accosted by a family, be mistaken for a nurse. The bulk of your mid 20s living here to serve. For fractions of the salary you actually deserve. Did I interest you in gender norms all of the time? No, I want to stop the gender norms. Inside, as it is, has grown to such massive proportions that it's probably actually fucking impossible at this point for me to collect even close to everything there is about it, even just on YouTube. This sense that all of this is going to burst at any moment, it just has to, it can't sustain like this, not with this much speed, not with this much force, and the fear of what will happen when it ends, when it hits the brick wall. I am genuinely very happy with my level of recognition, which is very minimal, and would not want any more of it. Like, I don't want to be any more known than I am. And the other fear, the deeper fear, the unspeakable fear of never hitting the wall, of this feeling never ending, never slowing down, but rising forever, endless and pointless climb towards a terrible and dense nothing. Animations, parodies, covers, edits, discussions, analyses, me right now. It's all everywhere. It is everything. 
the internet takes something and transforms it into every form you can think of. There's so many cool edits and animations too, but the sheer number is, is truly staggering. One of these animations actually caught my eye, and I believe it to be oddly relevant to the next topic I'd like to discuss. Do I have your attention? Yes or no? The reason I'm drawing attention to this video in particular is because of the odd fan slash performer dynamic being portrayed here. I genuinely really like the actual animation and art themselves, but the story and picture being painted here just seem off to me. This desperate rush to get through to the performer, the artist that you look up to, this one-sided plea on two sides, one being a performance and the other being an emotionally charged reaction. This is the exact animation clip that really got me to start heavily thinking about Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. What she had to... Okay, enough of this shit. Should I audition for American Idol? I could do that. We think you've changed, bro. We know best. You suck. We think we know you. We think we know you. All right, let's talk artist audience dynamics, everyone's favorite topic. Art is, of course, an inherently two-way exchange, as the interpretation of a work by the audience is just as crucial as the actual initial intentions of the artist when creating said work. However, despite the artist-audience relationship being absolutely necessary, it can also very easily and quickly transform into something less necessary. And by less necessary, I mean fully parasocial, so, um, n not necessary, then. This is a juicy starting point, and there's a lot of things to discuss here, so let's first begin with a talk on hyperanalysis, semi-stalkery shit, and whether or not any of this is actually that weird given the public nature of most of it. Bo Burnham was one of the first ever internet stars, if you will, and because of that, it's not really a surprise that his following has been very amplified, as all things on the internet tend to be. It's not really a case of doxing so much as it is just super following everything he does when he's not inside. Every time he's out in public, every show he performs at the Largo, his reactions within an audience, it's all up on the internet for all of us to see, sort through, and know. Now, I think it's also very important to mention my own role in engaging with much of this as well. As having followed Bo Burnham since around or before Make Happy, I've consumed so many goddamn clips and information all this shit that I'd say I'm probably just as guilty of following him to an excessive degree at times. Now, with all this being said, pretty much the entirety of this stuff is public. The Largo shows, for example, while at an exclusive private venue, generally unannounced and not allowing recordings, are still shows where he's performing new material. So keeping tabs on all the songs or bits he's workshopping isn't all that weird, especially in a bubble. However, I just think that when we look at all these different internet archives together, it paints a very full picture that's worth digging into. With all of the raw data and pictures and videos and information we have at our disposal and regarding this public figure, it's very easy to form a parasocial kind of relationship. I think Bose pretty much always had this very complicated and not necessarily great relationship with his audience. A part of me loves you. A part of me hates you. A part of me needs you. A part of me fears you. I mean, for years and years of his career, even extending into Make Happy, he notoriously had constant hecklers, being fueled by the dozens of viral videos of Bo's responses to heckling at all of his shows. Bo himself even spoke on the matter in a Reddit AMA, essentially saying that his hecklers aren't even doing it out of ill will most of the time, uh, in fact just thinking that they're contributing to the show. These hecklers were of course still a pretty tiny portion of the audience, but I do think give further credence to the idea that Bo Burnham's audience is prone to take things too far and get a little parasocial. I love you. No, you fucking don't. <laughs> you do not. You. Stop participating. Most recently, there was another event in which I was made a bit uncomfortable by some of the public discourse I was seeing in various Bo Burnham related subcommunities. That's right, the Emmys. Okay, look at this man in a ski cap. Hold on, just a second. There's Lorene right there, right? Okay, wait, hold on. 
Watch her come through. That's her, I'm assuming. Hold on, just a second. Hold, please. Hold, please. Okay, there's Ski Mask Guy again. Okay, wait. Okay, wait. Ski Mask Guy. That's her, right? That's Lorene. The amount of people overanalyzing the backgrounds of shots to follow the trail of Bo Burnham as he actively hides his face was, you know, pretty weird. Not that him wearing a ski mask to the Emmys wasn't also very weird, but it's not like any major news or trade publications were even taking note of him at all in the event. Bo fans just figured this all out on their own, which is interesting. At a certain point, this has got to be kind of excessive, right? R right? So what's the point of talking about parasocial relationships in this video about the two inside specials? Well, I think with both specials, there's value to be gained from looking at the works both with a parasocial lens and without one. There's a certain type of comment I've seen more and more ever since Inside came out that I think may relate to the fact that for the first time in Inside, Bo actually talked about his panic attacks directly within a special rather than just in interviews. You'll see an old clip of him from a live show where he gets mildly agitated or has to deal with a heckler, and these are the comments that you'll find everywhere underneath. It's basically people either wondering if this is a clip of him having a panic attack or outright quoting lines about panic attacks from inside so as to assert that this clip is showing one. Also note the common phrase you'll see in these, after watching Inside, because again, Inside was the first time he talked about these panic attacks in a special rather than just an interview. Say it with me, kids. P -p perception Perception depends on who you are. Subjective, subjective, it's really not that hard. A lot of people seem to have taken Inside as a documentary above all else, and I think that's what's led to such a large influx of comments overanalyzing all of these subtle mannerisms in his old clips to fit them within the narrative that he's having a panic attack in them, regardless of how most of the time it doesn't actually line up with specific instances or dates he's mentioned in interviews or anything. However, when you believe that you understand someone, regardless of whether or not you actually even know them, you may very well begin to interpret everything they've done or everything they do through the lens of your own subjective perception of them. I think it's important for us to maintain awareness of the boundaries between artist, art, and audience, and to ensure that our engaging with art doesn't falsely create a belief that we're actually familiar with the artist or performer. This is a constructed piece of filmmaking. This is not a documentary. If it were, he wouldn't have struggled so much with waiting for some big idea that's going to tie it all together and make sense of it and satisfy me. I keep thinking that I'm done. I'll write an ending and I'll film an ending and then I'll edit it and I'll watch it and then I'll feel like I'm not done. I have to do something else. Assuming inside or even the inside outtakes are entirely authentic is a disservice to the amount of effort and meticulous crafting put into them. How does he do it? How does he pretend to do it? How does he remain contrived? I'm not, I'm not honest for a second up here. It's all an illusion. I'm wearing makeup. I'm wearing makeup, 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 makeup. Inside definitely channels a lot of very real feelings and emotions without a doubt. Bo discusses his panic attacks in this medium for the first time in multiple different ways and goes on to put many other elements of himself into the work, whether dissociative or depressive. However, this is a very concisely crafted special that has very specific goals in how it's received. Throughout all of 2020 and 2021, Bo Burnham simply didn't actually spend all of his time in that shed. There's a girlfriend and a dog in his main house that are entirely cut from the picture and aren't referenced once, and that's for a reason. They don't fit into the story being crafted here, and this isn't about showing an honest portrayal of his actual day-to-day -day life. Even in the outtake special, everything is still limited to this room because that's what this special is limited to. This is not a depiction of his life. This is a depiction of him working on this project within this room and getting stuck in his head creatively. Assuming that this is wholly representative of him as a person is one of those things that just feels, you know, a little parasocial. 
I feel like a lot of people do understand this, but I do still think it's worth bringing up for those who still haven't yet made that distinction. However, once again, it's important to acknowledge that there are still very clearly elements within the special that do seem to be rather authentic, genuine. As such, this leads us into a very important discussion. Yeah, so I think this song Sexting is like kind of mid, like it's, you know, it's funny, but it's, it's not like that funny. I, I feel like it's like the, the only one that I gain no glee in re-listening. The initial Inside Special already does seem to cover an overwhelming feeling of dissociation and derealization overtaking your perception of reality with the song That Funny Feeling, but the Outtake Special expands on it further with what's probably my favorite of the new songs, The Future. I'll concede that the music video in particular is what really drives home this very dissociative feeling of the song, but the song's lyrics themselves do feel rather dissociative, even if not quite specifically describing the actual feeling of being dissociated, which won't lie, isn't, isn't great. Living in the future, when your present is so awful that you're hitting that old escapism button in order to leap forward and try vicariously living this imaginative life where things are better and you have actual people jobs or assets grounding you to reality. The lyrics carry with them the sense of indifference to the subject's currently dwindling life situation, so perhaps a sense of apathy would be more apt as a descriptor than dissociation? Really, if anything, it's just the general situation itself putting a thin veil of separation between us and the world. Do you realization then? I'll bother figuring out the right term when I bother getting dressed. It's just another day living with this video finally edited and published and I'm living in the future. Uh, I'm living in the future. Uh. There's a very distinct difference between Bo's performances in songs like this, Funny Feeling, and All Eyes on Me versus a lot of the other songs, especially earlier in the special. It's the difference between being mentally present and being, well, absent not at all there, <laughs> lacking the energy or will to make goofy faces. <laughs> Ultimately, I wouldn't say that the future is as much about dissociation as that funny feeling. However, as a whole, I feel like it gives off a much more dissociative vibe in regard to Bo's performance, the way it's shot and the actual tune itself. However, Bo's performance in That Funny Feeling is also rather interesting when we're talking about dissociation. While it's not as outwardly clear that the song's subject isn't mentally present, the very calm, campfire-esque tune to which the song is sung really does drive home that dissociative state, with the strongest reaction to all of this at this point just being that funny feeling. We're seeing the culture derived from a postmodern capitalist society being viewed through the lens of someone who sees and experiences the world through a filter of dissociation. And that's why the biggest conclusion to be drawn at the end is It'll be over soon. The song isn't necessarily trying to get you to agree with its acceptance of the end, but it's more so trying to paint a picture of this specific perception of this already inherently distorted culture, with the calls to action being much more on the subtle side here, with lines like 20,000 years of this, seven more to go which specifically references the global timer set by the UN, telling us how much time is left before the damage done to the environment and ecosystem is irreversible and has permanently put the end of the Earth's lifespan in closer view, still giving us the information to be like, oh, maybe we should like, especially get on that now that only six years remain? All Eyes on Me also does have a somewhat dissociative feel to it, although this one is particularly emphasized to be odd or feeling off through the actual audio distortion and misplaced laugh tracks that produce an all around clear feeling of things not being quite right. The result of being in your own head for this long. You're basically out of your head. I also think it's interesting to note that both in All Eyes on Me and Can't Handle This, as we're seeing Bo in both specials finally expressing some of his truly genuine emotions and feelings, his voice is modulated and modified so as to still retain a sort of boundary. 
I often like to call inside a representation of being stuck inside your own head creatively. In fact, I've called it that multiple times throughout this nonsensical video alone. But I think at a certain point, that word, creatively, stops being as relevant to the phrase and it just becomes stuck inside your own head. And being stuck inside your own head certainly does cause issues, whether that be anxiety, panic, stress, depression, or the topic at hand, dissociation. I think a big reason why the elements of dissociation and that striking line and that funny feeling Total disassociation, fully out your mind Googling derealization, hating what you find Resonated with me so much is because, unsurprisingly, those were feelings I could relate to. Big, big twist there, I, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've, I've struggled a lot with like kind of heavy dissociation over the last couple of years. And while it used to happen almost exclusively following a, a panic attack or, or something like that, nowadays it's, it's certainly, you know, more, more, more frequent. <laughs> all this to say, the way in which songs like The Future are able to capture that feeling is, is truly incredible to me. It's just such a hard vibe for me to really communicate or explain. But I feel like this song really does do a terrific job of getting that feeling across. Not that funny feeling, but a less humorous, more confused. Associative feeling. And so I, I really appreciate it for that. These themes of dissociation may not be consistently prevalent in the two specials, but they do most definitely impact the special as a whole in a larger way, even if not overtly. Once you've become dissociated from the world and society around you, the things that are in your immediate vicinity are the things that define you, who you are. Everything becomes your special, and it doesn't take long before you begin. I'll find a way. Man, I gotta find a way. But if I don't, who gives a shit? It's all over anyway. I regret every single joke that I've told. I was young, but lately, being young. Get in line. I've lost. Green Goblin Bo is a husk of himself. After you've put so much of yourself into your work, what's left? Who is the person that remains? How long will this keep going? Throughout the specials, there's constantly this ever-present focus on the ending. Whether it's ever going to end whether it has to end, whether it can't end. So this is how it ends. I see a lot of people attribute much of the displayed struggles of ending the special to Bo's feeling trapped in this room, in the quarantine, at home, which I can understand, particularly since he elaborates on his difficulty of writing an ending in the outtakes. The thing that I'm writing about is an ending, so it's hard to end whatever this is. It's, I feel like I'm waiting for some big idea that's gonna tie it all together and make sense of it and satisfy me. However, I think in general discussion on the special, there's too much emphasis on Bo's hatred of being inside. While one element I feel is too often overlooked is that he also likes being inside. He doesn't want to leave. He wants to stay in this creative space without having to put this special out into the world. Recently, I've been feeling like, oh man, maybe I am getting close to done with this. Maybe I'm gonna finish it after all. And that has made me completely freak out because if I finish this special, that means that I have to not work on it anymore. And that means I have to just live my life. And so I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to not finish the special. I'm going to work on it forever, I think. This seems to be a big element in the ending of the original special as well, with Bo finally putting the special out there, meaning he's no longer safe within the confines and comfort of this room that he's been relying on. 
I think it's important to clarify here that as I'm referring to Bo in this section, I'm referring to the version we see of Bo here, not actually the man himself. While I do assume there to be a lot of crossover between his genuine feelings and the feelings we see depicted on screen, I can only comment on the themes explored through this fictionalized version of Bo. Anyway, there's most definitely a heavy emphasis on this increasing reliance on the safety of isolation. Real world, human to human tactile contact will kill you. And that all human interaction should be contained in the much more safe, much more real interior digital space. One should only engage with the outside world as one engages with a coal mine. Suit up, gather what is needed, and return to the surface. I promise to never go outside again. Much of this seems to be serving that metaphor for being stuck in your head creatively, which seems to be particularly clear in that clip of him committing to work on the special infinitely, as no longer working on the special is a much scarier reality than simply never finishing it. I feel Inside rides this line between showing an increasing hatred and irritation for this isolation, and an increasing dependence and need for this isolation. A part of me loves you, a part of me hates you. Part of me needs you, part of me fears you. Yet, as much as he desires to keep spinning his creative wheels for eternity, the special has to go out. The special does go out. And you can't go back. You're outside forever. The thing is, this desire explored throughout the special to stay inside, to keep working, to never release this project, it's also aiding in a process in which the artist and the work begin meshing together. This particularly becomes an issue with a project specifically like this, in which you're performing as yourself, yet still writing in threads and story beats to follow as yourself, choosing which clips to put in of yourself to tell a specific story that may not be yourself. If I invest my well-being in that, I'm at the mercy of the thing going well and other people. And that is just like, it's not that I, because I have integrity, I'm literally like trying to protect my life. Is the role of an artist a sacrificial lamb, putting their understanding of self at risk in order to use their established identity as a form of entertainment for others? Is workshopping this type of project in essence workshopping yourself? Are you- Interesting. Are you- Content. Are you watchable? Who are you? Who will you be? It's almost like the struggle throughout the special is mimicking the wave of social media in which the market said here, perform everything to each other all the time for no reason. Now this desire to perform is instilled upon us from birth. This is the standard. This is the way to find yourself, discover yourself. When you're naturally searching for the truths of your identity as you're growing up, who you are, who you should be, this becomes the natural solution to that. Practically a necessity. Placing all your value in this externally portrayed version of yourself. Not even the version of yourself you show to others in regular interaction, but a version of yourself captured in a bottle in a moment of pure performance. <laughs> it becomes this infinite loop of creating content with the version of yourself you're trying to present to others, watching that version of yourself, becoming more of that person, and repeating and repeating and repeating. It's an echo chamber of yourself being broadcast to everyone. It's prison, it's horrific, it is performer and audience melded together. All eyes are on you, yet you're the only one there, infinitely going through the same cycle, becoming content, allowing your humanity to strip away as you become that husk. Where does the artist end and the art, sorry, content begin? This is the kind of process where the person who comes out may not be quite the same as the one who came in, where you can only pray that you make it to Perhaps that's what Bo's talking about when he says, the thing that I'm writing about is an ending. This cycle isn't limited to just his own experience writing this special, isn't just limited to the circumstances of the pandemic and quarantine, but that larger cycle, that larger trend, that trend of performing. It's about performing. I try to make my show about other things, but it always, ends up becoming about performing. So again, I bring emphasis to that clip where Bo expresses the difficulty of writing and ending. 
how do you write a resolution to a problem that you genuinely can't solve? Well, there's certainly one way. You don't. Not to imply that this ending doesn't resolve the special, because obviously it does, but it's not proposing a solution here. Bo already did that and make happy, and to reapproach it in the same way would be purposeless. This time we're not just watching or listening to someone perform, we're following someone's story. We're following this character who's facing these issues directly, and this character ultimately finds themselves faced between two undesirable realities, and once they finally make a choice between them, it's too late to go back. In Make Happy, Bo's discussion on the desire everyone feels to perform today, in the modern world, all culminates towards a single piece of advice. If you can live your life without an audience, you should do it. The question then becomes, is that something accomplishable? The iPhone 14 Pro has four cameras on it alone. Everywhere we look, there's no escaping the suffocation of... Hey, wait a minute. This fella sure looks familiar. But hey, that's just a theory of- Okay, I'm treading the line of getting too speculative. My bad, I'll reel it in. Bo Burnham's work, to me, has for a long time had a very empathetic touch to it, something I've noticed has only increased with time and with each new special. I'd honestly say that very little of his material in the specials presently available on Netflix come off to me as mean-spirited, at least when discussing people, humans. Even stuff like repeat stuff wasn't really critiquing the individual artists referenced in it, like Justin Bieber, as much as it was criticizing the companies and systems that actually led to that awful cycle in the first place. Inside, I think, is so filled to the brim with, well, not optimism, that I think the empathetic side to it can sometimes be a little hard to wholly discern. Which is why I found it interesting that the finale song of the outtake special was The Chicken. Is it sort of dark when you read into the lyrics and think on it? Yeah, no, for, for sure. <laughs> uh, but, but I think the thing that stands out about the song is genuinely just the premise itself. It's like Bo Burnham took the why did the chicken cross the road joke and was like, okay, now make the chicken empathetic. <laughs> or I suppose alternatively, it interprets the question of why did the chicken cross the road entirely differently? What really motivated them to cross that road? Why? There are so many different interpretations and takeaways I've seen of this song, and I think that's something really special about the song. I love how it really lets you sit with it, think on it, and determine how you feel about it and what you think it means. Going back to the placement of this song in the special, I think ending the outtakes and presumably the inside saga as a whole with this song carries meaning with it, at least to some degree. The song wasn't written specifically for inside, but I think that's exactly why it actually works here. Most of these two specials are focused on the effects of these larger, exploitative systems and cycles on one's self. However, with the chicken added here to cap everything off, we're getting almost a reminder of why caring for others is just as important. Empathize and understand the struggles of others. Don't allow them to go through this alone. Don't allow them to get trapped in a home situation that leaves them eternally isolated. This isolation can still be overcome by just reaching out. Everyone is going through their own shit, even that person you meet on your daily commute who's just crossing the road. We may not as individual people be able to truly dismantle these larger systems taking advantage of our neurochemistry for profit, but what we can do is be kind to one another, form human connection. Why are these specials special? Because it speaks to the viewer, and while indirectly, says, I understand. People each have responded to the specials in different ways, but that's because these specials ultimately find themselves multi-layered. There's this sense of physical isolation connected to the pandemic and quarantine. There's this sense of creative isolation and finding yourself trapped in a project that you're afraid to escape or complete. And there's this overwhelming sense of isolation in the commodification of human connection and reduction of the human experience to a view or like counter, with genuine intimacy and connection more and more frequently finding itself uprooted by this need we feel to perform. Performing. Looking back on your life as a satisfied audience member. Simply an illusion. You're everything you hated. Are you happy? Simply an illusion. Simply an illusion. Simply an illusion. Simply an illusion. <sighs> oh. da, 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 da. 
Is there anyone out there? Or am I all alone? It wouldn't make a difference still, I don't wanna- God damn it.